So thank you very much. It's a very big pleasure to be here for this lecture. Uh, indeed, I was uh, supposed to attend uh, or to give this lecture in 2020, but we had this uh, terrible circumstances with the pandemic and the conference was postponed uh, and I was again invited this year. Uh, I started to teach, and it's, it's a very special lecture and I'm extremely pleased and happy to be here. I started to teach in the Florence course in 1992, which is uh, a long time ago. Uh, and I think, so I've been teaching for about almost 30 years. Uh, so during these 30 years, the F Florence week for Pilar and me, for the family, has been a special week, it's just a marker of the summertime and very intense work. Uh, so we have enjoyed it and learned a lot coming repeatedly to Florence. I think it was extremely happy in the 90s when it was middle 30s uh, to have been invited by Rodolfo and Franco Merletti to become member of the faculty. Uh, because then I had the unique opportunity of uh, uh, just sharing the course with Jordi Sunier, which is the other thing I was very lucky when he accepted to share the course in environmental epidemiology with me. So it has been about 30 years going through environmental epidemiology and seeing changes in the discipline, taking these changes to the course. So also thank you very much to uh, Neil and Lorenzo for inviting me. You know that this distinguished lecture sometimes is a way to stimulate the retirement of the senior professors. So you are told that you will be invited for a distinguished lecture, so then you accelerate your, your retirement. I, and I think it's a very good good policy. So also thanks for, for this opportunity. And I, I think that to some way compared to the Antonio's lecture, I'm not going to talk about something I've been doing during my career. I will talk to you about something that's new for me, as it may be new for you. Uh, basically something that I started to think about six years ago and to work more intensively in the last three years. So Take this, despite being a senior distinguished lecture, please take it as the lecture of a beginner. So the title is From Environmental Epidemiology to the Epidemiology of the Anthropocene. Well, and the outline I will follow, I will, I will structure the presentation in three parts. In the first part, I will introduce the Anthropocene and the planetary health concepts. Then. In the second part, I will move to which are the main type of challenges that this new situation is posing to us as epidemiologists and to epidemiology as the discipline. And in the last part, I will briefly talk about some issues that may be relevant for epidemiology as a field or a discipline in the context of the Anthropocene. And let me begin with a very uh, a strong sentence. So climate crisis, humanity has never faced a greater challenge. Okay? And this is one of these sentences that's very difficult to digest or very easy. It depends because it's something that we have been uh, listening hundreds of times or thousands of times. So sometimes I need to, to take references. So who is saying that? And here there is Three references, I am strong uh, attached to them and I very respectful what they, they say. One is Greta Thunberg, the other is Mary Robinson, who was former president in North Ireland and then responsible of human rights in the United Nations and the current general delegate of United Nations, uh, uh, Antonio Guterres. They are reminding us continuously that this is true, that this is a true sentence, it's not an exaggeration. But what really impresses me of the underlying understanding of these people is that something that strongly moved them to pronounce this type of sentence is their understanding of science, what climate science is telling us about it. So I don't like very much to ask questions to the people in the audience, but it will help me very much if uh, you tell me how many of you have seen in Netflix the documentary Breaking Boundaries? No one? Okay. <laughs> this, I mean, it helps to calibrate 
because otherwise I move to the last slides and then <laughs> we make it shorter. But this is the concept of planetary boundaries. As climate and earth sciences have been increasing understanding what, happen, what is happening to the earth natural systems, they came with this idea that for some systems like climate, biosphere integrity, land systems, fresh water, oceans, for these systems, you can define some control variables that are useful to monitor how much the system keeps healthy or, keeps or is going to be destabilized. And then it tells you about the risk of going to disruption in these systems. Well, this is a very simple concept, but it's tremendously consequential. Well, this is a paper in Science in 2015 when these people updated a previous paper in 2009 and then included new, new information. And basically, they came to the idea that we are basically in all these systems moving from an area that we can say sustainability and safety to areas of, of disruption where the risk of big alterations in the systems is sharply increasing. So the green is the safe, the red is the high risk of uh, sometimes unpredictable catastrophic events, and the yellow is an area of uncertainty but increasing risk. Well, two of these systems, which is the climate and uh, we call in the previous model, it was called biodiversity, nowadays it's called biosphere integrity, these two systems seem to work as a core regulators of the full system. So alteration of the systems may lead to generalized destabilization of these systems according to relatively complex, contrasted, repeated uh, predictive models. Well, this idea of the planetary bound, and there is a wonderful documentary by, uh, by David Atom. Uh, David Attenborough and uh, Jochen Ronström from Sweden, who it tells for plain people wonderfully what is the planetary boundaries. But this idea of the planetary boundaries has a more integrated framework of understanding, that is the concept of the Anthropocene. And this is a paper that came in science in 2016, basically uh, building up on stratigraphic uh, samples collected all over the planet, and in these samples, the geologists and different scientists were able to identify indications of the human footprint on the natural systems. And in this particular is a sample of uh, ice in uh, Greenland, where there is, uh, for the experts, evidence that uh, this has been a geological transition. And then they say, well, we are not longer in the Holocene, what we have been living for 11,000 years, with a quite thermal temperature, with an average variation of plus minus one degree, to a new area in which we have global warming. We are now beyond this one degree of variability for 10,000 years. And then together with extinction of species. Sorry? Yeah. Sorry? Should I go, go back? No? Okay. And then it's not only uh, a glo a global warming, it's also extinction of species, big impact on the geological flows of the land, basically nitrogen, phosphor, and other elements, new materials, so microplastics being practically ubiquitous, permanent layer of air pollution, what we call air pollution with a certain local mentality, it's becoming a global aerosol which impregnates all the atmosphere in which the planet and all living beings are going on. Okay. So this concept of Anthropocene, by the first time in geology, again, it conveys a strong uh, consequential and social implications that go beyond the geological community. And basically the message is due, due to the human uh, impacts on their scientists there is, in the, on the Earth systems, there is evidence that we are at risk of having tipping cascades and 
big generalized disruption that will not be compatible with the type of life we know of the future generations. And this is why these people like Greta or Mary Robinson or Antonio Guterres say this is the main existential risk for the humanity. Then I will ask you for a, for a well, and this is a, another important thing that it's probably the more uncomfortable message that is the urgency in the problem. And this is a report of the International Panel of Climate Change. You know that they produce a big report every five years, indeed three reports. So the last ones have been reported in the last uh, year and a half. But this is an advancement in 2018, saying what we have agreed in the Paris Agreement, that temperature should not go beyond two degrees. It's probably too risky, and it should be 1.5 because the qualitative, the evidence show that there is a qualitative difference. And they say for this, we need to reduce 50% emissions by 2030 and be zero in 2050. So there is an existential threat for humanity and we have less than a decade to make a difference. Otherwise, uh, they may be true. The scientists may be true. They most likely will be true, unfortunately. So here I, I ask you and I ask myself, okay, so how is epidemiology and how are we as epidemiologists responding to the new context of the Anthropocene? Well, I mean, irrespective of how we are responding, this is a very relevant issue. And, and the first answer for me was in 2015, when I was reading, by the way, in a plane, contributing to the carbon footprint, this paper in Lancet. And this paper came from a revelation. Okay, sometimes in your scientific life, you have some revelations, not many, uh, hopefully, but some of them, and then you decide what you do. And this revelation was when I was reading the paper, before finishing the paper, I said, Joseph, you are going to change your mind respective to public health and epidemiology, I'm sure. And it was the case. So in 2019, I had took the opportunity to finish my, my uh, management roles and all my research on asthma and environmental epidemiology, put all this aside and start to work in this field, more from a translational view than as a researcher, obviously. And why this was a revelation? First of all, because it started with a paradox. And the paradox was, why in the last 50 years, global health, has been, human global health, has been increasing substantially in average, despite inequalities, in, just in parallel to the opposing trend of the health of the natural systems? And to me, we have been 30 years saying, environment is very important for health. And then how do you explain if environment is important for health? How your human health is going better if environmental health is going worse? There are, it's not a trivial question. There are several explanations. And the commission came to the idea that uh, what it happens is that we don't take whether health gains today are achieved at the cost of eroding the Earth's natural systems. It's a very long paper hundreds of citations, extremely multidisciplinary, but at the same time very sharp. And they say, let's propose a different way of thinking about human health. And they say, planetary health. As the achievement of the highest standard level of health that we can only get through judicious attention to the human systems, because these systems shape the natural systems in which humanity can evolve, in other ways. There is no human business. Okay. Well, if you can make it simple, and this is what I did for myself, and this human health and the health of the planet should go together. So planetary health is not the health of the planet. It's the health of human plus the health of other uh, living beings plus the health of the natural systems. If some of you came from infectious diseases, one health is a relatively twin concept. I have no time to go on this, but it's a concept. Well, then, uh, when Paco Palmer is a, it's a designer and, and a friend, and we were together looking for, an, uh, for a logo for planetary health. 
And we, 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 uh, we saw that in the internet you can have hundreds of similar figures, but it's always a human who is uh, taking care of the health of the planet. And we say, no, no, this is the opposite way. We, we have made things worse. So what now we have is the opportunity for the planet to tell us what we should do. And we try to translate this change of concept with this image in which the Earth is who is healing the human patients. And we had the opportunity to, friend with, to publish with friends in a, in a Portuguese journal. Well, in the Lancet paper, they use a taxonomy of challenges. And they say challenges of imagination, challenges of knowledge, challenges of implementation. And I will take this taxonomy, this classification for the second part of the presentation. And I will very, just in a very general way, to tell you my, my views on imagination challenge, knowledge challenge, and implementation challenge. So let's begin with the knowledge challenge. What I have been, what I have been saying before, to me, is a change of paradigm. So it's changing the concept of health and changing my way of thinking. And, well, basically because human health and the health of the Earth are to be seen as very intimately interdependent. And this has several consequences for the way of thinking. This image is the Singapore rivers taken from the outer space. But it's, it's to remain as that some indigenous and traditional cultures see our arteries and veins as a continuation of the rivers of the earth. And by the way, the first time I was told that it was by a student in this course, that was Christina O'Callaghan, that was talking to me about her experience in doing remediation studies or epidemiological studies in the, in the Amazon forest due to uh, uh, oil petrol leaks in indigenous populations. Well, if we accept that our health and the health of the planet are intimately interconnected, then should we as epidemiologists or epidemiology care about the health of the planet, not the planet as a risk factor for us, but the health of the planet itself? And if yes, how much? Or should epidemiologists, to be a bit more uh, precise, be involved in measuring how much human health affects the health of the planet. And I think that these are imagination challenges. I mean, are very, very, very important to challenge our way of thinking. But if we want to move forward, we need to move to the knowledge challenges. Well, let me begin from, in retrospect, to my evolution as epidemiologist about the knowledge challenges. So this is, a, you know, I don't need to remind the Rothman model of component causes that we have been learning with this model. Uh, and the model uh, assumes that uh, diseases are due to clusters of sufficient causes that are integrated by component causes. Obviously, in the last 30 years, epidemiology has made a big process improving methods to understand the interconnection of these causes and how these causes interconnect with uh, confounding factors. And we have developing new methods. You have seen this in the program that these methods have been, uh, been featuring in the EPE program in the last uh, decade or so, or, or, or even more, like the directed cyclic, as the directed cyclic. I, you, you, please keep reminding me because I mean, uh, <coughs> these uh, new methods have been evolving and Mendelian randomization, etc. We have been learning a lot, excitement, but this processes rely, or this evol evolution re re rely on the same paradigm that its environment is a risk factor for our health. And we are not dealing with the health of the natural systems per se. Okay? Well, this is a, in, the, in the good sense, don't take in any, any negative connotation, it's a reductionist approach in epidemiology and epidemiology, main of evolution epidemiology has been reductionist. So going in depth, to precise problems and looking for solutions. And sometimes we, we see people like Antonio today taking just a step back and trying to generalize, but again, immediately you will need to be came reductionist again 
and, and being precise in how to develop the methods, okay? But this reduction is, has always generated discontent in epidemiology. And I remember that a key moment in our course of environmental epidemiology here was in 96, when uh, Mervyn Sasser and Ertha Sasser published two papers indeed in American Journal of Public Health that they say, let's to replace the Rothman black box paradox or model for a Chinese box metaphor. And they suggested that epidemiology should change the way of thinking and move from individuals to communities. And basically they say three elements. One is levels of organization, molecules, genes, individuals, societies are different levels of organization. Uh, risk factors are interrelated across the different levels of organization. We have seen the very good studies in genetic epidemiology. And we should put history, society with individuals in our frameworks. And this was very uh, interesting because it uh, reignited the interest for ecological studies and multi-level studies, and we devoted many case studies here in Florence to this type of designs. But very interestingly, and surprisingly to me when I went back to these papers, the ECHO label came from ecology as a method, but there was no one single reference in the paper to the natural systems which was the subject of interest for ecologists, okay? So we as epidemiologists took the eco-label, but not the interest for the earth. And then this was very important because it built up development of social epidemiology. And I think this has been an important step. What I am proposing today is that we need to challenge this model as well. And in which way? Well, basically going to a better understanding, so a knowledge challenge, of this interdependence between human health and the health of the planet. And I will suggest you to explore two concepts. One is directionality of causation. So the consequence of this paradigm is that allows for the study how humans or human health affects the health of the planet, in addition of the other way around. And the other is to understand that this happens in the context of uh, what we call socio-ecological systems, where we in interrelate with all living beings and the natural systems. Okay? Well, the directionality of causation, so human health drives health of the planet, which is a bit provocative. So I'm not saying that we don't need to keep studying how the planet health affects our health. Obviously, we should do we should keep investigating how the health of the planet temperature affects human health. But we need to go to the other way around. How much human health is affected the health of the planet temperature? And you may think, well, it seems a bit extreme case, and it's not. Okay? Well, one example that it's not is this type of studies. This is an area that has been growing for the last six, seven years. And these are studies that measure how much healthcare systems impact on the planet's health, which is the footprint. And you have here the footprint in different systems, the greenhouse gases, particular matter, uh, fresh water, nitrogen, uh, nitrogen dioxides and sulfur dioxides. And they use a methodology, quantitative methodology, is input-output analysis, it came from economics, like. Antonio came, take, took inspiration for econometrics in some papers. Uh, but these guys, who the, the developer uh, gained the, the Nobel Prize in his days, the life cycle analysis measure the footprint of activities, processes, or health systems. And the conclusion of these studies, based on data from 189 countries, 2010-2015, is that Healthcare systems globally account between 1% and 5% of uh, global impacts on the earth. So the rest of global impacts, the 95% are obviously the fossil fuels, our consumption, etc. Okay? But we as a healthcare account for 1% to 5%. In some countries like Australia, the healthcare systems may account for maybe 7, 8, even 9%, maybe 10% if you are very, very comprehensive measuring at the national level, so it's not trivial, it's unimportant. 
And in these studies, we are going the other way around. And I think that this can be extended to many other settings in epidemiological studies. And I suggest that epidemiologists become interested in this type of methods. And I suggest that in the future, not in the future, indeed in the coming years, we urgently need a carbon epidemiology to develop as we have seen epidemio genetic epidemiology developing. Well, the other concept for the, for the knowledge challenge is that all this happens in the context of socio-ecological systems, which is a relatively new concept. And here you have an example that came from the International Panel for Biodiversity, and it's a conceptual framework, and it's very useful. And this conceptual framework, uh, just forget about the greens and blues that are the more interesting part, but it's too long. And just in the, in the black type letters, which is nature, it's providing eco-services and uh, benefits to uh, people, and we take from these benefits and services to develop good quality of life and health, and, and our, at our time, we as humans, through uh, institutions, governance, and other indirect drivers, have anthropogenic uh, impacts on their systems, which affect the uh, health of the natural systems. Currently, most of this arrow has a negative sign, and the big challenge is to reverse the type of effects and to make this arrow a positive. But we need to understand, and this is totally new regarding the eco-epidemiology concept of Sasser and Sasser, in the sense that it's not enough with the social, we need to put the natural systems into the big picture. Well, the other probably uh, simplifying challenge for knowledge is the systems thinking. When you move to this type of global studies and socio-ecological systems, you need systems thinking. And systems thinking approach, I think that has been discussed in some papers. I mean, uh, Neil and others have uh, papers on these issues, but it has not strongly developed and debated in epidemiology. And I think that this is probably an urgent need. And here you need to understand what complex science means and which type of methods we, we mean when we talk about complex systems. So complex science systems, I, I, this was a change in my way of thinking. Probably this is about 15 years ago when I started to work with people doing network analysis and working in complex systems. Ricard Sole, a colleague in the university, it's an associated professor in the Santa Fe Institute of New Mexico. And this is a definition of complex systems, which mainly tells, well, these systems are not linear at all. Uh, they have positive and negative big feedback. So they have loops that may reverse direction, directionality of causal effects. And very important, they may have emergent properties. So the systems can develop behaviors that are not present in the baseline models and are totally unpredicted new uh, situations. And uh, well, this is a, a, an idea that I think is extremely uh, useful. It changed my way of thinking. This is when I really uh, put uh, uh, just back the, the type of reasoning that I learned with the, with the, with the uh, Rothman model. Uh, and then you need to move to which type of methods they people talk about when they say complex I am methods. And this is I am entering into a totally uh, feeling which I am ignorant. But I have done some work with people working in applying network analysis to, to studies of multimorbidity. Uh, and, uh, and I think basically they talk about system dynamics, agent-based models, uh, and network analysis. I was very, very interested when Antonio say, well, this, there are ways to predict uh, with dynamic models the those response curves, okay? And I immediately say, well, but, uh, but what about if we take also the disease as a dynamic process, not only the exposure? So, so the exposure and the disease exhibiting uh, this type of dynamics, okay? So probably this is closer to the dynamic models. Also, agent-based models were very good examples in public health and network analysis. I suggest two readings. One is a paper by Margari uh, Margarita Cerda and, uh, and Case in American Journal of Epidemiology 2018 about systems modeling to advance data science in epidemiology. 
they basically show examples of uh, social epidemiologists modeling the epidemics of heroin addiction uh, and uh, obesity uh, using uh, dynamic models and complex science models. And then there is a debate with uh, Sandro Galea and Miguel Hernan uh, some months later in American Journal of Epidemiology discussing how so the Sandro and Miguel defend that probably you can see which are the links between the causal inference model and the counterfactual type of science with what these people do in social sciences. So I think that this goes the, 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 an example of knowledge challenges. So let me move to the next two slides to implementation science. Because the more important thing is that we have less than 10 years. So we need to, if we want to do, we need to do urgently from, I mean, as epidemiologists. And I suggest that there are two issues that illustrate the challenges in implementation for epidemiology, for the Anthropocene. One is the need to understand scenarios. And the other is to the need to model these scenarios globally. Uh, this is an example of a scenarios. I mean, these are typical scenarios of the International Panel of Climate Change are based on what is called radiative force. That is the difference between the intake of energy and how energy is reflected to the outer space through the albedo effects. Uh, and and they, they have different pathways from the ones with less uh, radiative force, which less temperature increase, less emissions, and the one which is more uh, the, the worst one. And, but the recently, the, in the last assessment, the International Panel of Climate Change has adopted what is called shared socioeconomic pathways. And, and, I, and, and I suggest you to read about this, these pathways. They are narrative about the future worlds. And they don't imply any specific political ideology. You can easily see that some ideologies are going to take you to some pathways, but, but it's not political ideology in the pathways. It's just about social models of economy, social developments that are classified according to whether you respond properly and reduce the challenges of adaptation and mitigation to low, or you don't do anything and the challenges remain very high. And just to put an example, pathway one is the best one, which is the taken the green road, which is global population peaks mid-century, the emphasis in well-being, environmental friendly technologies and renewable energies came very soon, and there is a strong and flexible institutions. You immediately see that, unfortunately, this is what, it's not what is happening in the last years, at least in the last five years, okay? And probably there are indications with the Ukraine war and the developments with uh, Europe and China that we may move to probably the more undesirable scenario that it's the regional rivalry where the challenges of mitigation and, and, and will be mitigation and, and adaptation will be maximized, which is not very good news. How you can model these scenarios? And this is a very nice example. It's a study, a study done by uh, people in, in, uh, in London, uh, Ian Hamilton and others in UCLA. Uh, what they have done is to use, uh, global, or use international data for these nine countries, very different profiles, and they have modeled how much the national commitments in the, agree, in the Paris Agreement that it's letting, let, let, taken us to a two de degrees uh, increase can have benefits in the, global he in, in the human health. So modeling the co-benefits. And what you see here is that there are basic in all countries, you have in orange the sustainability scenario uh, and it's modeling energy, food systems and transportation and measuring NCDs due to air pollution, diet, and physical inactivity. And you have millions of deaths prevented in these countries with these mitigation policies. So very important co-benefits. The economical value of these benefits in some countries are higher than the cost of the mitigation policies. And there, is, there are good papers on this. Well, with this uh, very simple review of imagination, knowledge, and implementation challenges, let me move very rapidly to what I think may be some issues relevant if we can imagine an epidemiology for the Anthropocene. And the first, I will talk about changing our practice. The second, changing education. 
the third changing research, and I will finish with an evocation to what may be seen as imagining the renaissance of environmental epidemiology. Well, the practice of planetary health. I mean, epidemiology should work now more than ever vis-a-vis -vis with public health. I mean, we have always reminded that in the Florence course, but this is now more important than ever. Okay? And then what it means to work with public health in the, in the context of the Anthropocene, and I developed to myself this two by two table. So it was my main advantage of being an epidemiologist in this field. And with this table, you can imagine situations that are win-win, good for the planet, good for us. Situations that may be bad for the planet and bad for us. And the two other ways around, okay? So you have interest, then you can think by yourself in your own areas of interest and your table, your two way to table. But let me very shortly go to good, good. And the good, good, the concept is co-benefits. And what you have seen is the Ian Hamilton and colleagues' study, which is a very strong example of co-benefits from mitigation policies that are good for the planet. And it's plenty of examples in food sciences, in, la in land management uses, in food systems. So it's plenty of opportunities for epidemiology to work f with public health into this context of planetary health. The opposite is things that are worse worse. I mean, and smoking. And wh when I did develop this two by two table a few years ago, I asked myself, well, what is smoking doing to the health of the planet? I say, no idea. I went to the PubMed and there was no single paper in the PubMed, no one. But there was a report of W. now there are papers, but there was a report from WHO saying one of the worst and more destructive agricultural practices in the planet because they produce deforestation, desertification, intensive use of pesticides. So it is more than ever a strong reason to eliminate tobacco. At that time, the environmental smoking definition, some of you might remember, it was passive smoking. So we care about human health. Okay? No, this is smoking damaging the natural air systems. Okay? And it's plenty of examples, and the one of health systems and antimicrobial resistance is the example of bad for us, but may, uh, good for us, but bad for the planet. And it's more, more difficult to identify examples here. Probably our trade-off, we, at the beginning of the, 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 the epidemic, we thought maybe COVID is going to be bad for us and good for the planet. And with Christina O'Callaghan, we wrote a short commentary on saying COVID as a disease of the Anthropocene in the, just the beginning months of the pandemic. Unfortunately, we have seen that it has been bad for us and it's going to be bad for the planet as well, most likely. Uh, but this is, suggests ways of changing our practice. Education. This is a summary, uh, this is a summit called Our Future, Our Planet. It was organized in 2021 by the National Academy of Science in the US and the Foundation of Nobel Prizes in uh, Sweden. And it was uh, ended with a call for action. It was signed for about 120 Nobel Prizes. And they, I took a sentence saying, universities should embed the concept of planetary stewardship in all curricula as a matter of urgency. And I think it's the case, okay? And probably we are, we are late. Uh, this is what we are doing in our context in Pompeo Fabra University, we have developed a, what is called planetary well-being, which is basically translating this concept of planetary health to planetary well-being. And there, are, there is a multidisciplinary task force. Now it's led by an archaeologist that is working on this direction and trying to extend the concept in the university. And we have started a master on planetary health, probably the first one of this type worldwide, it's now being taught in, uh, in Spanish and, and Catalan. Uh, Catalan, I'm sorry, I need to remind my, myself and, and to all of you that it's a language that uh, despite all our efforts for more than 300 years, it's a subject of political hostility uh, in the Spanish state and governments. And, and, and this is uh, one of our tragedies in Catalonia. Uh, and we have developed also an elective course on planetary health for the master in public health. So the students now are, uh, have the opportunity to take this course. What about research? Good news. HERA is a, a, it, it, means, uh, it means health and environment 
research priorities for the European Union. It's an horizon project. It was coordinated by Robert Barucci and Manolis Kogevinas and has reviewed all research priorities for health and environment for the next, let's say, five, ten years. And very importantly, planetary health and issues that relate to what I have been seeing ha are in the agenda. You have the agenda here, uh, and in different areas there are more of planetary health. Some areas uh, still are very traditional paradigm. But what is important is I'm reasonably optimistic that these priorities will translate into funding opportunities for the next years. And why I am uh, relatively optimistic is because the European Union has taken this European Green Deal as a strong political commitment with sustainability and with climate action. And this is being translated to many policies. And indeed, now we are working on a new topic, probably will be made public in the next month, which is a call for projects, funding for projects, which is the title is based on planetary health. Okay, that will probably be the first one, and I'm pretty sure that this will grow in the future. Let me to finish with two figures, two images. First one is about this is a complex journey. Changing our mind, changing the paradigms, it's always difficult. Uh, it involves many moments in which you feel lost. But there is a compass for this journey, and the compass is SDGs. I accept that SDGs sometimes are very, there are many goals, uh, there are complex interrelationships. This is a very nice figure that was used in programming the Nobel Prize uh, summit that I mentioned two slides ago. Uh, and this basically summarizes the SDG saying, the main challenge is to restore sustainable, uh, the, the society with the biosphere integrity and the sustainability of the earth while reducing inequities. And the, the, I have not mentioned it inequities, but I mention now with emphasis because all what is happening with the natural systems reinforce the evidence that inequalities are, strong, are very important, strong determinant of health and a moral imperative for public health. So I think that this is a good image to summarize. And I, now let me finish about what I mean uh, this uh, two, probably two poetic sentence of uh, the re imagining the renaissance of environmental epidemiology. And this is probably there is a lot of light. Some of you may have had the opportunity to visit Capella Brancaccio here in Florence and to admire this fresco of Masaccio. It is, has been said that it was one of the few visits uh, outside of Paris that Picasso made was came to visit the, paint, the frescoes from Masaccio in Capella Brancacci. Uh, uh, and Masaccio, there are, some, there are many, many lessons in, in, this, in this painting, uh, but one of them is about the talent of the young people. Uh, and this was painted in 2000, uh, 1427. Masaccio died in Rome for reasons that are not known one year after, at the age of 28, but in between, he had changed, or he had opened the door of the art of painting to the ideas of the Renaissance. And some very important art critics have said that in this painting, which is about the distribution of alms, it's basically related to the tributes we paid for our properties in, at that time. Probably there was a strong political debate in Florence that days, in the 15th century. And it was, uh, and, uh, it was telling the importance of the, the Republic and the taxations for the social justice. I don't know how much social justice was in Florence at that, at that year, probably not much, but, but the debate was there indeed. And I think that, uh, that Masaccio with this open a new way of thinking and about the, the human dignity, which is probably one of the more strong messages of the Renaissance. So let me finish here with a dream that uh, some of you will contribute to the renaissance of environmental epidemiology in the future. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>